you do for the Denver Police Department? Keep your voice up, Mr. Flynn. Yes, Your Honor. I'm an NCIC agent. Um, can you briefly tell us what an NCIC agent is? NCIC stands for the National Crime Information Center. It's a database maintained by the FBI, and I have a clearance to work with secure criminal information that's on that database. Ms. Kendall, I want to talk about um, when you were younger, when you were a child. Where did you grow up? I grew up in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And when were you born? In 1983. 26 years old now? That's correct. Where did you attend elementary school? I went to a school called ECA Evangelical Christian Academy. While you were a child in Colorado Springs, did you learn of the concept of gay people or homosexuality? Yes, I remember during the discussion about Amendment 2, during the Amendment 2 campaign, um, my parents would talk about uh, homosexuals um, seeking special rights um, and how they were um, essentially evil people and uh, how they felt threatened and how our family was threatened by homosexuals. At that time, did you know what a homosexual was? No, I didn't. I just knew it was a big, long, scary word, and I found the whole concept very frightening. Mr. Kendall, what is your sexual orientation? I'm a gay man. When did you first realize that you were gay? When I was a little kid, I knew I liked other boys, um, but I didn't realize that that meant I was gay until I was probably 11 or 12 years old. How did you come to realize that it meant you were, that that meant you were gay? I was a precocious kid, so one day I ended up looking up the word homosexual in the dictionary, and I remember reading the definition, uh, something along the lines of uh, a romantic attraction between members of the same sex, and it slowly dawned on me that, that that's what I was. Given your prior testimony about homosexuals, how did you feel when you realized that you were gay? Well, once I connected this all together, I realized that what a homosexual was, the fact that I was a homosexual, and the fact that my family and community did not like this concept. I was scared by that, and I realized this was bad news for me. So I kept this a secret, and I hid it as far away from everyone as I could. Around this time, did anyone talk to you about being gay? When I was in seventh grade, I remember being taunted. Uh, about being gay. Um, some of the older boys and boys in my class would call me names and things like that. What kind of names would they call you? I was called a, a faggot, I was called a homo, a queer, um, or even just gay. Other than name calling, did these boys do anything else to you? I remember one incident. Um, I've worn glasses since I was in like the third grade. I need them to see and a couple of the boys took my glasses um, and played monkey in the middle, keep away, uh, and uh, threw them over my head um, until eventually they broke them. What was it like for you to be in that school? How did you feel? It was scary going into that building, realizing these kids were taunting me with a word that was so close to the truth. Um, and it was very upsetting. I would go home uh, and get in the car when my parents would pick me up, crying and telling them what had been going on. What did your parents do? My parents uh, were horrified that I was being treated so poorly, so eventually they took me out of that school and placed me in another one. At the time they did that, did your parents know that you were gay? No, they did not. Did your parents ever find out that you were gay? Yes, when I was uh, 13 years old, at one point my uh, parents discovered my journal and uh, for the first time in that journal I had admitted to myself that I was gay and I had actually written those words um, and they found that and read it. What happened when they found that journal? My parents uh, flipped out. They were very upset. They were yelling. 
I don't remember a lot of what they said, um, but it was pretty scary, the level of their reaction. Do you remember anything they said to you when they found the journal? Yes, I remember my mother looking at me uh, and telling me that I was going to burn in hell. Were you in a religious family? Yes, uh, I grew up in a very religious family. Uh, church and God were, were everyday parts of our life. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> what, what did you think when your mother told you that? It was shocking. Um, I never heard anything like that from my mother. Uh, I never thought that my parents would ever say anything. I mean, hell was the worst. Um, you don't get much worse than, than eternal damnation. And I was uh, just totally stunned that they had said that. Your parents later tell you anything else about you being gay? After my parents found out, my home life changed a lot, and my parents didn't take it very well. And I remember my mother um, calling me names. Did they make any efforts to, um, to put you in any therapy or to change you in any way? Yes. Um, Shortly after this incident, I was sent to a, uh, a, a Christian therapist um, for reversal therapy. Why do you say it was a Christian therapist? That's how he was identified to me. Can you tell us the goal of the Christian therapy? <laughs> yes, I was told that the goal was to make me a heterosexual. How many times did you go to this therapy? I went two or three times. Do you remember anything you did at the therapy? I remember um, a little bit. I remember the therapist telling me that homosexuality was inconsistent with Christian teaching and that my parents didn't want me to be gay and I needed to change um, and that homosexuals were bad people. Did Christian therapy make you feel better about the situation? No, it didn't. I um. I always wanted to be a good kid and to make my parents proud and suddenly I was in a situation where they were taking me to see this guy who was telling me I was a bad person and, and they were telling me I was a bad person and uh, I remember feeling very, very alone. <coughs> was the therapy successful? <coughs> it, it, by that I mean, did it reach its goal of making you a heterosexual? No, I was still gay. Did you try to become heterosexual during those therapy sessions? No, I didn't think it was possible. Why not? I knew I was gay, just like I knew I'm short and I'm half Hispanic, and I, I just never thought that those facts would change. When you stopped going to this therapy program, did you go to any other therapy programs? Yes. Um, my parents have been referred by Focus on the Family to another organization um, called NARTH. What's Focus on the Family? <clears throat> Focus on the Family is a uh, Christian family ministry based in Colorado Springs, Colorado, where I grew up. And what's NARTH? NARTH stands for the National Association for Reparative Therapy of Homosexuality. It's a reversal therapy organization based in Encino, California. Did you um, voluntarily go to NARTH? No, my parents made all of those decisions for me. How long were you at NARTH? About a year and a half. From what ages? 14 to 16. During the time that you were at NARTH, how was your home life? My home life had changed a lot. Um, it was like night and day. I remember before this all started, uh, I had the kind of parents who would drive me to school and hand make my lunches and, and write notes, put them in my lunch. And um, after this, um, they were always yelling at me. Um, they were calling me names. Um, and they were just telling me really horrible things. And it became a really 
uh, emotionally and uh, verbally abusive environment. Any names were they calling you? My mother would tell me that she hated me or that I was disgusting or that I was repulsive. Uh, once she told me that she wished she had had an abortion instead of a gay son. She told me that she wished I had been born with Down syndrome or I had been mentally retarded. Um, things like that. Meet with at North. I met with uh, Dr. Joseph Nicolosi. Who was Dr. Joseph Nicolosi? And Nicolosi was the uh, executive director of North. And was he also a therapist? Yes. Where would you Where would you meet with Mr. Nicolosi? Um. Most of the time, I would go into my parents' room, and my dad had a separate line at his desk, and I would call in and do um, uh, over-the-phone sessions for like an hour or an hour and a half. But I did actually uh, fly out to California to do some in-person sessions. What did you talk about during those sessions? I don't recall a lot of what was said during those sessions. I recall Nicolosi saying that, you know, homosexuality is incompatible with what God wants for you and your parents want you to change um, and that this is a bad thing. Were you given any advice on how you would be able to suppress your homosexuality in these therapy sessions? I remember it as a, a general admonishment but not a specific technique, no. You remained a religious person through your experience at North, correct? Yes. <clears throat> Is it possible that your experience at North helped you reconcile your faith with your identity as a gay person? At North, I was being told that I had to reject who I was on the most fundamental level because what that was was dirty and bad. Um, while I reconciled my faith with my identity, the therapy I went to at North played no role in that. How old were you when you stopped going to reversal therapy? I was 16 years old. Was it successful in that were you able to suppress your homosexuality? No, I was just as gay as when I started. Why did you stop going to reversal therapy? During this whole thing, my life had kind of fallen apart. Um, I didn't have the world that I grew up in, my faith, um, which was very important to me, my family, which was even more important. Um, everything had just kind of stopped. And I just couldn't take any more. And I realized at one point that if I didn't stop going I wasn't going to survive. What do you mean by that? Um, I would have probably killed myself. How was it that you were able to stop going to reversal therapy? When I was 16, I separated myself from my family uh, and surrendered myself to the Department of Human Services in Colorado Springs. And what happened when you surrendered yourself? to that department? I, uh, I went in and I spoke with a caseworker and I, I told her what had been going on in my family, uh, what had been going on with reversal therapy, um, and I told her that if I went back to that house I was going to end up killing myself. And so they started a dependency and neglect proceeding to revoke my parents' custody. Stop living with your parents and stop going to therapy? That's correct. And did things get better? I was a 16-year-old kid who had just lost everything he ever knew. I um, didn't really know what to do. I was very lost. And so the next few years, I um, wandered in and out of jobs. 
I uh, wandered in and out of attempts at school. Um, I was incredibly suicidal and depressed. I hated my entire life. Uh, at one point, I turned to drugs um, as an escape from reality, um, and because I was, you know, trying to kill myself. So no, things did not get better. How long did this period last? Four or five years. During this period, were you able to support yourself? It was a struggle for survival. Um, I wasn't really able to support myself. Rely on any public benefits or any anything like that during this period? Um, well, when my health care ran out, you know, I had to go to emergency rooms to, to get medical care, and the only counseling I could get were through state schools because I couldn't afford anything else. Kendall, you told us that you now work for the Denver Police Department, correct? That's correct. How long have you done that? Over two years now. So it would be fair to say that you've now you're able to support yourself and you're stable? Yes, it's been a, a long, hard journey, but I have fought with every bit of myself to take care of myself, to get a good job, to get some place to live, and I've been able to do that. I just have a couple questions for you, um, a couple more questions. Mr. Kendall, are you a member of any organization that advocates for greater rights for gays and lesbians? Yes, I am. Once? I'm a member of the National, or I'm a member of the Log Cabin Republicans, um, and I'm also uh, the current chair of the Denver Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual, and Transgender Commission. What is that commission? It's a advisory body that advises city agencies um, in the mayor's office on GLBT related issues within the city and county of Denver. Are you here to testify today as a member of Law Cabin or as a member of that commission? No, I came here to testify as myself, Ryan Kendall. Are you yourself personally an advocate for gay and lesbian rights? In my personal life, I am, yes. Kendall, was anything you said today in court shaped by your role as an advocate for gay and lesbian rights? Absolutely not. I've just told you my story, what happened to me. Thank you. I have no further questions for you. <clears throat> Mr. Campbell, you may cross-examine. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Mr. Kendall. I just have a few questions for you. Um, have you ever lived in the state of California? No, I have not. And you didn't have any role in the campaign to oppose Proposition 8, did you? No, I did not. You didn't see any of the Yes on 8 campaign materials, did you? No, I did not. You were contacted by someone from the San Francisco City Attorney's Office who asked you to participate as a witness in this case. Isn't that true? Yes. When were you contacted by this person from the San Francisco City Attorney's Office? I don't recall exactly. I think it was late October. You have never read a scientific study addressing the concept of sexual orientation. Isn't that true? That is true. And it is, isn't it also true that you've never studied whether a person's sexual orientation can change throughout the course of his or her lifetime? No, I haven't studied it. Isn't it also true that you know people who have professed to be one sexual orientation and then at a later time professed to be another? In public, yes. And isn't it also true that, that you're not familiar with the American Psychological Association's position on conversion therapy? That's also true. <clears throat> Talked a, uh, at length about your experience with conversion therapy. Um, just want to touch on some of those points. Um, you were compelled to go to conversion therapy by your parents, isn't that correct? Yes. And nothing involved in conversion therapy was your, de your decision. It was all your parents' decision. Isn't that true? Yes. 
And when you began conversion therapy, you were not asked to consent to that particular type of counseling. Isn't that true? That's correct. At some point during your counseling, you communicated to your parents objections to the counseling treatment you received at conversion therapy. Is that true? I uh, communicated objections to what I was being told, both in my family and conversion therapy, yes. But those objections, they, they didn't make any difference because you didn't have a choice in the matter and your parents compelled you to go against your will. That's correct. Your only goal for conversion therapy was to survive the experience. Isn't that true? Absolutely true. You didn't have the goal of changing your sexual orientation. Or, I'm sorry, correction. You didn't have the goal of changing your sexual attraction, correct? That's correct. Indeed, you admit that you did not truly want to reduce your sexual attraction to persons of the same sex. Isn't that true? That's correct. Testified a little bit about the uh, alleged emotional harm that you've experienced from conversion therapy. Isn't that true? And you also discussed a little bit about um, some of the various things that your parents, specifically your mother, said to you. Isn't that right? Yes. Um, but you have acknowledged, haven't you, that your particular family experience that went along with conversion therapy was just as damaging to you as the therapy itself. Isn't that correct? Yes, I have. At some point, let me do it this way. Um, at some point, your parents' custody of you was revoked. Is that true? Yes. And that happened at age, age 16, is that right? Yes. After that point, at some, sometime after you turned 18, you went back to live with your parents for a short period of time. Isn't that, isn't that true? Yes, it is. You've established through your testimony today you were involuntarily forced to attend conversion therapy, right? That's correct, sir. But you would acknowledge that some people do want and voluntarily choose to undergo some form of conversion therapy? No, sir. That's not my personal experience. So you, you would not acknowledge that, that there's anyone who voluntarily chooses to attend conversion therapy? Well, I don't know everyone, but that's not my experience, sir. So my question is, is it your position that no one has ever gone to conversion therapy voluntarily? I can't make that absolute assumption, no. But it is my experience that people don't want to go to programs like NARTH. Well, you acknowledged in your deposition, did you not, that some people report to have effective results with conversion therapy. Isn't that true? Yes. I have no further questions, Your Honor. Any redirect, Mr. Flynn? While you were in conversion therapy, were you introduced to any people who purported or were purported to use who have successfully undergone conversion therapy? Yes, I was. Who was that? I remember during one of the group therapy sessions, um, Nicolosi tried out uh, his perfect patient, the guy who had been cured of his homosexuality, uh, and his name was Kelly. Did meeting Kelly have any impact on your views of conversion therapy? I remember once when Nicolosi stepped out of the room, um, we were talking amongst ourselves. Uh, and Kelly told me that later that night he was going to a gay bar and that he was essentially just pretending uh, f to be cured for the sake of his family. Well, how did that make you feel about the therapy program? I knew I was gay. I knew that could not be changed. And this just confirmed that this wasn't going to be effective for me. Um, one final thing. You said you returned to live with your parents. Is that right? For a brief period, yes. How long? A few months. How was your relationship with your mother now? I don't speak to my mother. No further questions. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Kendall. You may step down. And your next witness. Your Honor, the plaintiffs call Professor Gary Segura. <clears throat> Works permission.
commission will be handing out a uh, binder that has the main exhibits for direct testimony to court and, and the witness. Very well. Certainly. Your Honor, uh, Mr. Cooper asked if we could just pause while Mr. Thompson is um, brought back into the courtroom. <laughs> well, that would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair. Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> I think we can do the formalities and swear the witness and get him ready to go. Gary Segura. S E G U R A. Gary G A R Y. Thompson back amongst us? Not yet. Well, why don't we just stand up and uh, <laughs> stretch for a minute? <laughs> I'll wait <coughs> do it. Margaret, may I get another bottle of water, please? Oh, yeah. And the altruists became when you first requested them. Very well, Mr. Thompson, welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. Do you all organize now? Yes, sir. Oh, good. All right, <laughs> then we can begin. Mr. Boutros, you have a witness on the stand. Yes, thank you, Your Honor. Uh, good morning, Professor Segura. Morning. Could you tell the court a little bit about your academic and professional background? I'm a professor of political science in the Department of Political Science at Stanford University. I received a PhD in political science in 1992 from the University of Illinois. I've taught at a variety of institutions and came to Stanford about a year and a half ago. Uh, I also at Stanford, I serve as the chair of the program in Chicano Studies. Uh, and I'm currently president of the Midwest Political Science Association, which is the second largest professional association of political scientists in the United States. What is the Stanford Center for Democracy? The Stanford Center for American Democracy is a newly established center at Stanford that I co-direct with another professor designed to um, use empirical techniques to explore data about the American electorate um, and its implication for American democracy. Uh, our, our biggest project is the American National Election Studies. What does the American election uh, National Election Studies entail, briefly? The American National Election Studies is the gold standard, as it were, of uh, political science studies of the electorate. They're conducted every four years during an election year uh, with some ancillary studies leading up to the, to the election year. Uh, and it's been run consistently since 1948, so we have a very long portrait of what the American electorate thinks about politics. 
uh, and my colleague and I uh, just now are taking over the study. Do you serve on any editorial boards of journals uh, in your field of study? I do. I'm, on, I'm currently on the editorial board of the AJPS, the American Journal of Political Science, sorry, uh, American Journal of Political Science, uh, the Journal of Politics and Political Research Quarterly. I've previously served on the editorial board of uh, PS, Political Science and Politics. Could you describe generally the uh, nature of your studies and, and research work and specialty? I think of myself as a student of political representation. So um, my work is primarily political behavior, which is looking at the mass opinions and attitudes uh, and actions of uh, citizens in the society. Uh, as a representation theorist, what I try to look at is how these things <coughs> subsequently connect to the actions of policymakers. Uh, so that obviously representation has two ends to the relationship. Maybe you could just briefly describe what it, what it means to be a representation theorist. Um, so one of the vexing questions in political science from its earliest days is whether or not democratic governance um, by elected officials is in any way broadly responsive. Um, and so there has been debate off and on about whether or not the uh, elected officials are responsive to changing views of the public, uh, whether or not they are actually leading the public, uh, that is, the public is actually more responsive to elected officials. And so what I try to look at is the dynamics of how communication between elites and the mass public uh, change how people view and how the elites act over time. In your work, have you focused on the, the ability of minority groups to have their views heard and enacted into law? Uh, yes. I would say that um, while I, my work began as sort of a broad understanding of, of political behavior and its effects, uh, in the last decade or, or decade and a half or so, I've tended to focus more exclusively on minorities. Uh, I spent a lot of time looking at, at racial and ethnic minorities, and particularly Latinos. In your work, have you focused at all on the, the uh, rights in, of gay men and lesbians in terms of their activities in the political sphere? I have. And have you uh, published any books <coughs> in your career? Um, I have one uh, co-authored book just out this month, and I have a co-edited volume from several years ago. What is the name of the book that's just out this month? Latino Lives in America. And could you turn to Exhibit 2330, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2330, which is in the binder that you've been provided? Yes. What is that document? It's my CV. Does that include uh, a summary of your professional background? Yes. And does that document also include a list of your publications? Yes. Have you published any articles in peer-reviewed publications in your career? Uh, yes. Could you give us an overview of the, the number and type of publications you've published? Um, so I have about all right, 42 or so total publications. Um, so about 25 of those are peer-reviewed articles, meaning that um, it's an article-length document that's submitted for a peer review process in a journal that publishes a variety of different art authors each issue. I also have about um, some number, 15 or so, um, chapters in edited volumes, which means that I submitted the article, but then the article was grouped with several others and, and, and refereed in that manner. Have you given any conference presentations where you lay out the results of your research work and theories? Um, constantly. <laughs> Can you give us a ballpark figure over the last decade? Uh, probably, I don't know, between 20 and 40, it, uh, I, I present pretty constantly. Thank you. And, and there's, there's a list of examples contained in Exhibit 2330, your CV? Yeah, I think I just put the last 10 years or so in. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Could you please describe your work on gay and lesbian politics and political issues? I have three pieces published um, um, focusing specifically on gays and lesbians. Um, one is a piece in an edited volume uh, about the various aspects of gays and lesbians and their participation in the democratic process. And that piece is on um, how, uh, whether or not different electoral structures would, 
would favor or disfavor gays and lesbians and focuses specifically on the city and county of San Francisco. The second is an article in a peer-reviewed journal called Rationality and Society where I, I and my co-author try to model the, the, the self-identification and mobilization behavior of minorities who can pass as a member of the majority, that is, minorities whose identification as a minority is uncertain to the perceiving public. Um, and then the third is uh, an introduction to a symposium in PS, and it's a satirical piece in the wake of the 2004 election about the consequences of the 14 state ballot initiatives banning same-sex marriage in that year. What is PS? PS, um, PS is a journal that serves two purposes. It's published by the American Political Science Association. Um, it serves both as sort of a topical journal, kind of uh, events of the day and what political scientists take on those events would be, um, as well as things more suited to those who are functioning in the profession, suggestions about um, teaching ideas or syllabus ideas, news within the profession, uh, that. So it's, it's uh, both a, a newsletter for political scientists as well as a presentation of topical research. In your classes at Stanford, do you teach any, any um, courses that focus on the, uh, the participation of gay men and lesbians in the political process in, uh, recently? Um, I haven't actually taught gay and lesbian politics for probably about a decade, um, but at Stanford in the courses I teach on just broad questions of political behavior and, and particularly in courses on minority politics, I always include a unit on gays and lesbians. Ron, at this time I would like to offer um, ex Plaintiff's Exhibit 2330 into evidence as well as the, um, all the other exhibits in this binder and I will present with the court's permission, the clerk with a list, and I believe Mr. Thompson um, has agreed that he, there's no objections to this list of exhibits. That's correct, Your Honor. Very well. And you're offering? I'm offering um, all the documents that are on this list. I could list them or, or provide it. Would you like an additional list um, into evidence? Let's uh, let the uh, document speak for itself. Thank you, Your Honor. <laughs> Happy to do that. Thank you, Your Honor. In connection with your work on this case, Perry versus Schwarzenegger, what issues were you exact, asked to examine? I was asked to evaluate um, gays getting and lesbians. Opinions. Getting opinions now. Have you qualified? Oh, uh, I, yes, yes, Your Honor. Why don't I just why don't I just do that first? Um, Your Honor, I would tender Professor I tender Professor Segura as an expert on the subject of the political power or powerlessness of minority groups in the United States and of gays and lesbians in particular. Thompson? No objection, Your Honor. Very well. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, what, what I'll, I'll restate my question. What issues were you asked to examine in this case? I was asked to examine um, gays and lesbians and their participation and, um, and their, their uh, interests in the U.S. political process to determine whether or not I, I saw them as being um, powerful or powerless and what evidence uh, would be brought to bear to understand such a thing. In, in conducting your analysis and your work in this case, what, uh, what did you do to arrive at your conclusions? What type of information did you review and, and what kind of things did you study? Well, the first thing I did is I read. Um, so there, there's a growing literature on gay and lesbian politics. Um, and so I went out and found out kind of what the state of that literature was. Many of the pieces I was very familiar with. Um, some were new. Um, the next thing I did was try to go through the statutory status of gays and lesbians, because it varies quite dramatically from state to state, in order to determine um, what I thought the circumstances of gays and lesbians were with respect to statutory protection or statutory disadvantage in the states. I looked at public attitudes, including very recent data on public attitudes towards gays and lesbians. Um, I examined the presence or absence of gays and lesbians in political office. Um, and then I spent a lot of time looking at ballot initiatives, which are kind of the, the, the central question right now in gay and lesbian politics. In, in connection with your work, did you uh, review and rely on the documents that are listed on the exhibit list and in, in, in contained in the binder, aside from your CV, which is PX2330, um, 
in informing your opinions in this case. I did. And um, d did you also rely on your general knowledge and experience and work and reading through your career as a political scientist? I did. Um, when I was um, when I went through and enumerated the things that I focused on, I, I realized just exactly how much I read, which would explain my eyesight. Um, I have um, been, I started graduate school in 1985, so at this point I've read thousands of journal articles and hundreds if not more than a thousand books. Uh, so, you know, I've read a lot about, about politics in the United States. Um, many of these things inform my views, but the materials that I presented were the ones I focused on to make specific points in, in, in the arguments I was making. Did you rely at all on a book by uh, Robert Dahl in I did. forming your opinions? And, and Dahl, D A H L, and, and is that something you mentioned in your report and in your deposition in this case? It is. And and that is not the document we've included in the exhibit list simply because of the length. But um, is that a classic text in your field? Uh, I would describe it as canonical. Um, everyone reads Dahl. In connection with your work, did you review? Uh, the deposition testimony of Dr. Nathanson. I did. And and did you today review the videotape clips that were p played from Dr. Nathanson's deposition? I did. I was in the overflow room. And, and in connection with your work, did you prepare a rebuttal report to Dr. Nathanson's report when he was put forth as an expert in this case uh, by the proponents of Proposition 8? I did, and I was deposed a second time on that. And did you also review uh, the expert report and deposition of Dr. Miller, one of the proponents of Proposition 8's experts in this case? I did. Did you attend Dr. Miller's deposition? I did. I'd like to publish demonstrative number one and, uh, and ask you, Professor, um, to state very briefly with an overview what opinions you've arrived at in this case based on your work. So I've, I want to offer three, which I think speak to the questions that I was asked to consider. The first is that, in my view, when we consider the U.S. political system, gays and lesbians do not possess a meaningful degree of political power. They are not able to protect their basic interest and effectuate their interest into, into law and to secure those. Um, the second is that, um, relative to some other groups that currently enjoy uh, judicial protection, gays and lesbians are actually, in the statutory and constitutional sense, worse off than some of those groups were when they were granted judicial protection. And finally, um, I, I, I'm deeply troubled by some of the, the comments that, or some of the conclusions that Professor Miller drew in his rebuttal, and I find them unpersuasive. Why don't we, as a prelude to getting into the details of your testimony, Talk a little bit about what you mean when you talk about political power. How do you define that term for purposes of your analysis here today? For me, um, political power is the ability of an individual or group through mustering their own resources to achieve and secure their interests in the political system um, and, and, and to do so relying primarily on their on on themselves that is there has to be an exercise whereby their resources um, bring about the change that they're hoping to accomplish is that a definition of political power that is consistent with generally accepted notions in the literature of political science I believe that it is and, and in fact I think it's drawn directly from Robert Dahl's classic definition that a has power over B when A can get B to do something B otherwise wouldn't do. And there's a key element of that, which is that um, A is getting B to do something that B may or may not be predisposed to, because that distinguishes political power from simple agreement. Um, my current favorite example is I happen to be a New Orleans Saints fan. Uh, there's lots of other New Orleans Saints fans, but I don't have power over them. We just happen to agree. In, in, in your concept and definition of political power, how does the, the, the concept of pluralism in our democracy play out? So um, 
There, there is a, a theory of American government that was put forward first by, by the founders, by Madison and the Federalist Papers, and then sort of reinvented in, in 20th century um, political thought, um, specifically in the person of Robert Dahl, that um, one of the biggest threats to society is faction. That is, um, if you have uh, uh, individuals who are able to, to secure and hold power over a long period of time, without rotation in office, that they might con conceivably tyrannize other parts of the society. And so for Madison, the solution to this was the extended republic, that in the extended republic, there would be many, many interests. And as a consequence of the plurality of interest, none of them would be able to gain the upper hand for a very long period of time. And that would mitigate the dangers of faction and the, and the risk of tyranny. Um, in the 20th century, political theorists have conceptualized this as pluralism. The idea that there's an almost self-equilibrating system. There are groups and interests, and if they become too powerful, they disturb the interest of individuals who are hold a different opinion, and they organize. And so, to, it's almost Newtonian. To every action, there's a there's a reaction, um, and this is supposed to prevent um, the accumulation of power by one group. But it presupposes that there's no such thing as a permanent majority. And it also presupposes that this system of contestation is fair. And one of the chief critics of pluralism, E.E. E. Schatzneider, has a very famous quote. And the quote is that the flaw in the pluralist heaven is that the heavenly chorus sings with a decidedly upper class accent. That is, in, in this contestation between groups, it is people with resources that are more likely to uh, achieve outcomes and people without resources no matter how dedicated are going to be disadvantaged in that system. How does this concept of pluralism relate to the opinions you are giving here today regarding the power or powerlessness of gay men and lesbians in the United States? I think that by any measure gays and lesbians would have to be understood as a minority faction in uh, Madison's terms. That is um, people who um, accept the, um, the normativity, if it were, of heterosexuality uh, have held power essentially forever. So it is difficult with the resources that they have for gays and lesbians to press their cause in the political system. They, they just simply don't have the numbers and the resources to be effective advocates in a lot of political arenas. Do the courts, does the judiciary play a role in pluralism, in that concept of pluralism that you just described? Well, the reason we, we frequently refer to our system of government as Madisonian, and, and we say this as a contra, contradistinction to majoritarianism, because the founders, specifically, the founders and, and also the, the proponents of the first ten amendments of the Constitution, specifically uh, envisioned uh, a, a set of constraints to sort of rein in the majoritarian impulse. So it is certainly a society that responds to majority rule. But it's also a society where the, there are limitations on what the majority can do. The majority cannot gather together and vote to deny a whole group of people, say, the right to vote or some other basic, basic right. Now, when you talk about politi obtaining politically favorable outcomes, is that in and of itself sufficient to determine whether a particular group has political power in our system? Um, well, certainly... Favorable outcomes is certainly a positive thing that I would want to consider. Um, I would also want to know uh, some circumstances of the, of the favorable outcomes. Were they judicially triggered as opposed to legislative? Uh, were they passed with bipartisan majorities or with slim majorities? Um, what's the arena of contestation? Are we talking about a favorable outcome over some advantage that's being accrued to the, to the group, or are we talking about a favorable outcome trying to ameliorate a severe disadvantage? So uh, we would, we would want to take into account the process whereby the outcome was achieved and the subject matter of the outcome before we concluded that the outcome by itself was sufficient evidence. Can you give me an example of a, 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 a favorable outcome uh, that does not necessarily reflect the successful exertion of political power by gay men and lesbians? 
Um, there's a very good recent one. So um, there's been a lot of news recently about the newly elected mayor of Houston, um, who is a lesbian. And this was uh, talked about extensively in the news media as, you know, holy cow, there, there's, a, there's a gay mayor of a, of a major American city. Um, I know a little bit about Houston politics and a little bit about uh, Texas politics, particularly mayoral politics. And it turns out that um, the race that she was elected in pitted um, a white lesbian Democrat against an African-American male Democrat. Now, Houston is a city where there's been tremendous racial and ethnic divisions. Um, there have been tremendous divisions over development. That's one of the key uh, fracturing lines in Texas politics. So um, will the developers be allowed to, to, to do what they'd like to do, or, or, or should they be constrained? And so uh, there is a, a fairly complex web of racial and economic and social and partisan fracturing lines in Houston politics. That she was elected certainly is a positive element to consider for gay and lesbian political power. Um, however, I'd have to look at the context, and the context suggests that there was a lot else going on in that election. And just a few years back, Houston voters were actually asked to weigh in on the question of whether or not Houston city employees uh, can have same-sex domestic partner insurance benefits. And by a citywide plebiscite, they voted it down. So while there is now a lesbian mayor of Houston, her partner of 19 years cannot obtain health insurance through the city. How, how about the uh, recent signing into law by President Obama of uh, hate crime legislation that includes uh, hate crimes based on sexual orientation? Does that, how does that, ref does it reflect political power? Um, I would say it reflects positively on gay and lesbian political power on one dimension and negatively on two. So the positive news out of the, um, the hate crimes legislation is that this is a 20-year priority for gay and lesbian activists, and it was achieved in November or October, I think, uh, of this past fall. Um, so that's clearly something that they were, were, were happy about. Um, from, from the opposite side, I would consider both the context in which it was passed and the, the subject matter of contestation. So what we're looking at here is a piece of legislation that criminalizes um, bias-motivated attacks on gays and lesbians. So we're not talking about uh, you know, a huge victory that, that you know, creates you know, gay spots in a service academy or something like that. We're talking about sort of ameliorating a real serious element of disadvantage that gays and lesbians face in American society. The other thing is that in order to get it passed, it was attached as a rider to the defense authorization bill. Um, and it's a c common practice in Congress to attach more controversial pieces of legislation to more consensual pieces of legislation to make it harder for people to vote against it. Uh, so it was attached to the defense authorization bill. And even though it was attached to the defense bill, 75% of the Republicans in the United States Senate voted against it. They voted against the defense authorization bill, which is not a customary Republican position in the Senate. So I think that when we consider how the hate crimes bill was passed and the fact that we're talking about criminalizing pretty vicious behavior, that would weigh against an, uh, a, a judgment for political power. In analyzing the political power of a particular minority group, is it also uh, appropriate to look at the vulnerability of the favorable outcomes that have been achieved? Um, well, I, I'm not sure it's, it's necessarily the case in all circumstances, but it's certainly the case for gays and lesbians because of the role of ballot initiatives. So in a number of jurisdictions, most of the western part of the United States um, and, and parts of the east as well, uh, laws passed by the legislature or laws passed by even uh, city and county uh, legislatures are able to be overturned by popular plebiscite or there's a process where citizens can just have a law voted on uh, through the initiative process. And initiatives have been used to roll back legislative gains by gays and lesbians over and over again. In fact, uh, between 1990 and the middle part of the 2000s, there's been probably like 150, not even counting the same-sex marriage votes, there's been like 150 votes on gay and lesbian, usually on gay and lesbian anti-discrimination protections. Um, and they lose about 70% of the time. Now, when you're looking at political power and on a particular issue, is it also a 
factor to, to that you consider uh, that the the importance of the issue to the gay and lesbian community or whatever minority group you're talking about is that another factor you apply when you're looking at uh, favorable outcomes. Well, um, sure. I think we would want to look at the subject matter of any uh, piece of legislation. Um, so, for example, in California, uh, there's now a standard clause, a standard anti-discrimination clause that's attached to the end of many pieces of California legislation. Um, and they might have to do with state licensing requirements on some profession or, or some type of business or whatever. And then at the end, they say, it shall not be discriminatory. I wouldn't call that a victory for gay and lesbian rights because it's not clear that gays and lesbians were, you know, actively working for, you know, rights in insulation contracting or in, you know, some other sort of licensing issue. We want to focus, when we want to focus on estimating uh, political power, we want to focus on the things that are important to the group who, whose power we're trying to assess. Would marriage qualify as one of those salient, important issues that would serve as a marker? Yes. Um, in, speaking of markers, in your expert opinion, what are the, the markers of political powerlessness? So um, there were two types of markers I talked about in my report. Um, the first are sort of manifestations. Can we look at the results of power or powerlessness? And then the second were the causes or the factors that might contribute to those results. Why don't we start with the uh, manifestations of political powerlessness uh, of gays and lesbians in the United States. Could you give us uh, an example of one manifestation that uh, supports your opinion regarding the powerlessness of gays and lesbians? Sure. Um, the first thing I would look at is the, is the, the absence of statutory protection or the presence of statutory disadvantage. So if, if there are laws hurting you and there are no laws helping you, that would be evidence that you have uh, a lack of power. I'd like to display demonstrative three, which, and, and ask you to comment a little bit about the absence of um, protections in the United States for gay and, and gays and lesbians. Okay. And in fact, um, could you describe what this uh, demonstrative three that we put up on the screen reflects. Uh, these are, this map displays the states that have statewide, um, some form of statewide protection for employment non-discrimination against gays and lesbians. And, and uh, how many states do not include protections based on uh, sexual orientation against discrimination? 29. You uh, uh, watched Dr. Nathanson's testimony this morning, correct? I did. And you heard him mention the Matthew Shepard case? I did. Which state was Matthew Shepard's, uh, where, where did that event regarding Matthew Shepard occur? Wyoming. And um, is Wyoming one of the states that has, since that event, enacted any kind of protection based on sexual orientation discrimination? Wyoming has no protection, and this is a little bit off the, the topic, but Wyoming doesn't even have a hate crimes law. In terms of the 10 largest states in the United States, how many of them have laws that provide protection against discrimination based on sexual orientation? Uh, three. Let's look at the federal system. Um, are there any statutory absences in the federal system that, to your mind, indicate, in your expert view, a lack of political power on, on the part of gay men and lesbians? Um, yes, and I would say there are also statutory disadvantages at the federal level. So there is no federal level anti-discrimination protection for housing and employment. There is no federal level um, protection really on, on any level beyond the, the recently passed hate crimes bill. There is federal legislation uh, prohibiting uh, gays and lesbians from receiving partner benefits in federal employment as an incident of the Defense of Marriage Act. There is the exclusion of gays and lesbians from uh, service in the military. And historically, at one point, gays and lesbians were completely forbidden from working for the federal government. How long ago was that? I think that actually ended in the 1970s, but it started as far back as immediately in the post-war era, maybe President Eisenhower. 
And in that regard, are you familiar with a uh, man named Frank Kameny? I am. Can you tell us a little bit about Mr. Kameny's experience? Um, so in the early days of the homophile movement, the first um, pro-gay organization, and, and pro-gay is a, a strange way to, to describe this, but, but the first organization working to ameliorate the, the disadvantages faced by gays and lesbians was an organization called the Mattachine Society. Um, and it started on the, on the coasts, particularly Los Angeles and, and New York. Um, this was in the early 1950s. It then kind of fell on, on hard times, in, in part because it, they faced a, a lot of repression. Um, in the 1960s, the Manichean Society was revived in Washington, D.C., and Frank Kameny was essentially the, the principal organizer. And he took a much more uh, proactive stand than the, the leaders of the Mattachine in Los Angeles and New York did. So Kameny regularly would send letters to the, the U.S. government demanding that the uh, prohibitions on gay employment be dropped or um, you know, asking you know, why there were these various uh, obstacles to tax deductions or, or other benefits that other nonprofits enjoyed. So he was much more likely to engage the political system. Uh, was, was he uh, employed by the federal government? Um, I believe he had been dismissed, or I don't, I don't remember the exact circumstances of his participation. Um, let me ask you this. In, in terms of um, protections, well, let me back up. In terms of uh, statutory protections, does the fact that California includes a number of anti-discrimination provisions that apply to gay men and lesbians uh, affect your view regarding the lack of political power of that group? Well, it was certainly something I considered. Um, the presence of statutory protections is preferable to the absence of statutory protections in evaluating power. Um, that said, I would still want to look at the circumstances by which they were passed, the, the, the degree to which they're secure in the political system, and also the subject matter over which they're covered. Um, so in some instances, in, in most of these instances, these are attempts to redress discrimination. Um, so if we look at a hate crimes protection or we look at an anti-discrimination ordinance, the purpose of that is to um, ameliorate a disadvantage, ameliorate a wrong that, that exists. Um, while it's certainly good to have that, uh, it's, it's difficult to conclude that that measure of political power in and of itself. It would be akin to saying that because you have more prescriptions, clearly you're healthier. Um, no, uh, you have prescriptions because there's a problem. And the same would be true here. We have anti-discrimination statutes because there's discrimination. Um, the second thing I would want to look at is how those ordinances were passed. In some instances, some of the California ordinances were passed in the wake of court decisions ordering that policies be adopted. Um, this is true for California's anti-employment anti discrimination ordinance. And even though the courts had already held this, that political process was quite contested. Um, for example, the first version uh, placed the, the first attempt to codify this court decision placed uh, gay and lesbian employment and housing protections in the Fair Employment and Housing Act of California, and that was vetoed by the governor. And so uh, when the decision was codified, it was codified in the labor code of the state, which has a shorter time period for complaint and a much more uh, relaxed sort of regulatory mechanism. So there was, there, it was really, there was quite a bit of opposition even to codifying a decision that had already been handed down by the courts. And of course, the, the minority party in this state has, as a part of its platform, made it clear that it would like to repeal all of those. So I'm not sure I would... I would be certain that they're, you know, permanent protections. A, a third concern I would raise would be that we, it, it's problematic to focus only on a single jurisdiction because a domestic partnership ordinance in California does not provide any protection for you if your partner becomes ill on a trip to Las Vegas or attending the Mardi Gras in New Orleans. That when we look at, particularly when we look at Prop 8, these are national questions that the politics of the proposition was national, the politics of most of the ballot initiatives on same-sex marriage and on anti-discrimination involve activists from on both sides from around the country. Um, so I'm not sure I would conclude on the basis of some positive statutory outcomes, 
ameliorating some severe disadvantages, that that alone constitutes political power. Let me ask that dem demonstrative two that you prepared be displayed and ask you, uh, this is a quote from uh, Romer versus Evans, and perhaps you could read that uh, so it's into the record and then explain to me how that bears on your evaluation of California's uh, protections against discrimination to the extent they exist for gays and lesbians. So I'll preface it um, with the, there's a trope in the argument against protections for gays and lesbians that these are special rights uh, that gays and lesbians don't need. And speaking specifically to that argument in Romer, Justice Kennedy writes, we find nothing special in the protections Amendment 2 withholds. These are protections taken for granted by most people, either because they already have them or do not need them. What protections had Amendment 2 withheld in Colorado? Uh, Amendment 2 was a breathtaking piece of legislation. So um, at the time, several small cities, I believe it was like Aspen, Boulder, and Denver, that sounds right, uh, had passed, Denver, a big city obviously, but uh, had passed um, anti-discrimination ordinances. And so... A Colorado's Amendment 2 would have amended the Colorado Constitution to eliminate those local ordinances that were anti-discrimination ordinances, but it would also have prohibited any locality or the state legislature from enacting any future protections from gays and lesbians. So it was not just, it didn't just reverse the existing laws, it preempted any future action. How have ballot initiatives in this country uh, affect, affected the rights of gay men and lesbians uh, in terms of their political power? Um, well, for starters, there is no group in American society, and I would include in this undocumented aliens who are probably a distant second. Uh, there is no group in American society who has been targeted by ballot initiatives more than gays and lesbians. Um, the number of ballot initiative contests uh, since the, the first one in, in the late 1970s is probably um, at or above 200. Um, gays and lesbians lose 70% of the contests over other matters. They've essentially lost 100% of the contests over uh, same-sex marriage and now on adoption. Um, the initiative process nationalizes issues because money and activism crosses state lines so that even if there's a local uh, legislative majority to, to enact something for the protection of gays and lesbians, participation of people around the country can play a role in shaping a ballot process that would reverse it. Um, the initiative process has been really the waterloo of, of gay and lesbian politics. I'd like to display um, demonstrative number four which um, you, can, you can elaborate, but talks, it lays out what I think you just said concerning ballot initiatives. But let me ask you this. What is it about gay and lesbian politics and ballot initiatives that has, in your view, your expert opinion, caused the ballot initiative process to be unleashed in this manner against that particular group? Um. Well, the, you know, it's a hard question to answer. The, there is uh, proponents and opponents of, of gay rights would say that there's a culture war going on in the society. Um, and as a consequence, um, these, are, these are things that people feel very deeply about, and it gets them hot under the collar. Initiative processes have, they're a, they're a mixed bag historically. Um, on the one hand, they serve as a reasonable check on the behavior of the legislature if the population is dissatisfied. Um, on the other hand, they've frequently been used to target minorities. Uh, and, and this is not, not just gays and lesbians. But no group has been more targeted than gays and lesbians. And I think from a political science standpoint, what we would think about is sort of expanding the scope of conflict. That if, if your side is not doing well in the legislature, perhaps because of the partisan distribution, then you try to move the arena of contestation to the populace where you can motivate people through you know, campaign commercials. You, know, you, you inflame momentary passions. In your expert view, does the ballot initiative process put the gay and lesbian community at a particular disadvantage in the political process? Um, 
I would say yes, first and foremost, because of the, the numbers. So in the end, the ballot initiative process is a plebiscite, and um, you need you need votes. You need 50% plus one. Um, the ballot initiative process in California um, is particularly problematic in part because we allow the amending of the state constitution with, with a simple, plur, simple majority, and in part because um, we have really widely uh, varying rates of turnout between, say, ballot initiative contest and, and the contest that would produce uh, a state legislature, so that the state legislative uh, distribution looks a lot more like the underlying population than a, a turnout in the statewide election. Um, and of course, this allows money and and an organization to transcend state lines. So it moves the focus of the contest away from state politics alone and into a national arena. How many ballot initiatives have been passed relating to marriage between individuals of the same gender in the last decade? Um, I believe. 33 of 34, um, because in one state it failed, and then they came back in the next election and passed it, and that was Arizona. You mentioned that there have been other examples of the use of ballot initiatives against minority groups. You mentioned Romer. Could you give us a couple of other examples relating to other groups? Um, sure. In, in the 1960s, there was an attempt to... Um, overturn the implementation of the Fair Housing Act in California by having a statewide ballot initiative saying that landlords and property owners could rent or sell to whomever they wanted even if that was discriminatory in its practice. Um, there have been a whole host of ballot initiatives targeting um, immigrants and um, in some instances targeting more than immigrants. Prop, Prop 187 would be an example of that. What happened to Prop 87, 187? Prop 187, as I understand, was struck down at the lower court level and the state declined to appeal that ruling. Um, Prop 187 was really contentious because the official, the, the language of the initiative was that state employees could withhold state services from any person they suspected of being an undocumented immigrant, but the basis of that suspicion was not particularly clear in the legislation. And Latino activists in the state felt that that would create essentially open season on Latinos. That you know, if you if you walk in with a, a Spanish accent or with dark skin, you know that would be a, the the basis for a state employee withholding state services from you until you could prove otherwise. And what happened to the fair housing, the housing uh, proposition that you mentioned uh, from the 1960s? Uh, it was struck down. You know. The, um, is there an effect on the ability of gay men and lesbians to achieve political power uh, based on the fact that they are, find themselves fighting these ballot initiatives? Um, I would say there are two effects, one of which is, is um, obvious and one of which is maybe less obvious. The obvious effect is that um, legislative gains that are you know, hard-earned get overturned um, and in some instances, gays and lesbians find themselves, uh, even in the, in the events where they win, uh, contesting the same issues over and over again and spending a lot of, of resources on this. Um, I think that the less visible effect is that uh, it chills legislatures. Legislatures thinking about passing um, uh, some um, statute that would be advantageous to gays and lesbians, think twice about that because no legislator relishes being overturned by a plebiscite. How does the fact that ballot initiatives can be used to amend state constitutions have, affect the political power of gay men and lesbians? Um, the amendment process in many states, um, in fact in most states, requires that the vote of the people take place. So even were it the case that every elected official in California decided that Prop 8 were a bad idea, there's frankly nothing they can do to change it unless there's a vote of the people. Are gays and lesbians underrepresented in political office in the United States? They are. Um, at last count, only six, only six people have ever served in the House of Representatives who have been openly gay and only two of those were elected 
as openly gay. So in, in the other four instances, their sexuality became a matter of public record after their initial election. Um, there's never been a, an openly gay senator or cabinet member um, or certainly, you know, president. Um, there are very, there's only about 1% of the state's legislatures that are, that are gay and an even smaller, a much smaller percentage of local elected officials. Do you recall the percentage of local officials? I believe it's five hundredths of one percent. And how about state total state legislators? What is the, the percentage? Of I think it's right around one percent. Thank you. Uh, in in your view, how does the low number of office holders who are gay or lesbians affect the political power or powerlessness of gay men and lesbians in the United States? So in political science, we, we call the election of a representative who shares a demographic characteristic of their constituents descriptive representation. And uh, theorists who have examined descriptive representation identify two effects. The first effect is that um, there is the direct representation, that having a gay man or a lesbian sitting at a legislative table debating a particular issue, working out uh, the, the policy, uh, increases their voice. They are able to have their wishes at least considered in the process or whatever. Um, and the second is that the presence of, and, and less clear, is that the presence of, of gay men or lesbians in public office, or for that matter, racial and ethnic minorities or, or any other group, really serves to constrain some of the bad behavior of other members of the legislature. There's a famous case when um, Senator Mosley Braun was representing Illinois in the Senate, where the Senate kind of voted on without comment, reauthorizing the U.S., uh, con the congressional um, uh, resolution creating the Daughters of the Confederacy. And this just kind of swept through without any discussion. And Carol Mosley Braun went down to the well of the Senate and gave an impassioned speech about what that felt like and what that looked like to um, African Americans. And the Senate promptly reversed themselves as a consequence of her presence. And at the time, she was the only African American member of the body. So having someone from the group certainly directly represents their, their voices, but also uh, makes others a little less willing to, to engage in some thoughtless or, or disparaging behavior. So how does the lack of uh, participation or, or representation in high-ranking and other government positions undermine political power of gay men and lesbians? Well, for starters, in, in many parts of the country, elected officials have absolutely no problem speaking about gays and lesbians in a way that you could not imagine them speaking about any other member of the electorate. Um, so in addition to gay and lesbian um, concerns not being considered uh, meaningfully, for example, in the U.S. Senate, there are members of the United States Senate who, in public speeches, have compared um, same-sex marriage to um, marrying a box turtle. Um, there is a member of the Senate who has a hold on a judicial nomination because the nominee attended a lesbian commitment ceremony. Um, Senator Coburn has gone on record saying that the gay and lesbian agenda is the greatest threat to freedom in the United States today. Um, and uh, a senator from South Carolina, when he was elected to the Senate, uh, said during the course of his campaign that gays and lesbians shouldn't be allowed to teach in the public schools. It's difficult to imagine an elected official saying such a thing about really almost any other gr citizen group in the United States. Is the fact that some public officials feel so free to publicly denounce gay men and lesbians a factor that contributes to the lack of political power of that group? Um, absolutely, and again, I think it plays out in multiple ways. Um, first, this demonstrates a, a real hostility of that legislator, or perhaps his party, to the interests of, of gays and lesbians. Um, but secondly, when someone in a position of authority communicates to you that this is okay, then it moves those thoughts into the mainstream. So. If, if two U.S. Senators compare uh, same-sex marriage to bestiality, 
that makes that part of the mainstream conversation. That's not the fringe. That's a United States senator. And, and as a consequence, it legitimizes some of these sort of deeply hostile beliefs. Can you provide us with another example of a factor that contributes to the political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians? The simplest one would be the numbers. Um, there just simply aren't enough gays and lesbians in any jurisdiction uh, of any size to shape outcomes. Do the attitudes of other people towards gay men and lesbians uh, affect their political power? Um, I think that the role of prejudice is <coughs> profound. Um, so when we are engaged in the pluralist struggle, as Dahl and others envisioned it, we're engaged in a, a contest of, of ideas where I'm trying to persuade you of the rightness of my position and you're trying to persuade me of the rightness of your position. But if the group is envisioned as being somehow or another um, morally inferior, a threat to children, a threat to freedom, a th if, if there's these deeply seated beliefs, that the the range of compromise is dramatically limited. There's It's very difficult to engage in the give and take of the legislative process when I think you are an inherently bad person. Uh, that's just not the basis for compromise and negotiation in the political process. And, and did Prof Dr. Nathanson's testimony that was played today in court about the prejudice and hostility towards gay men and lesbians uh, affect your view uh, on this issue concerning political power? Um, it was consistent with my view in that I, I felt like he was agreeing with the position that I would take that there's a lot of hostility to gays and lesbians. It is still the case even today that a majority of Americans find sex between two persons of the same gender to be morally unacceptable in all cases. Um, another huge percentage finds it morally unacceptable in most cases. Uh, so uh, I think he he sort of validated the, the belief that I had based on my examination of the data uh, in, in the literature. I would like to display demonstrative number six, which you prepared based on your report and, and deposition, uh, and, and ask you some questions about what political scientists call a feeling thermometer. Okay. And I resisted the temptation to use a thermometer graphic, Your Honor, for that. <laughs> um, what, what in, in your field is a, a feeling thermometer? So a feeling thermometer is a simple question that we can ask respondents. Um, and it's an unobtrusive measure of sentiment. So I ask you, um, on a scale from 0 to 100, how warmly do you feel about um, evangelical Christians? How warmly do you feel about African Americans? How warmly do you feel about Democrats, about Republicans, etc.? cetera? And, and you could put any group in. What's nice about a feeling thermometer is because we don't, they don't know, we're not asking them to compare, do you like one group better than another? People are going to give us fairly honest answers. They might bias those answers upward. People tend to say they feel warmly about everybody, which is, I guess, nice to see, but, but a little bit dubious. Um, but be, they can say they feel warmly, but if they're still between group differences, we're looking, we're, we're identifying sort of differences in attitudes uh, by the general public across different groups. In connection with your work on this case, did you study opinion data relating to this sort of fe this feeling thermometer analysis? I did. How, what did what conclusions did you reach based on your analysis of that data concerning the political power of gay men and lesbians? Um, the conclusion I reached is that the American public is not very fond of gays and lesbians. Um, so, on a scale from zero to a hundred, almost every group you could imagine. Uh, that had any demographic identity that would be the source of contestation, so religion, race, and ethnicity, uh, were scoring in the upper 60s. So people were giving them a, you know, a score somewhere between 65 and, and 69. Um, and every group has its haters, and it turns out that for, for, for African Americans and Hispanics, Catholics and Jews, some number of people place the group below the midpoint, below the 50 score, um, between a third and, say, 45%. Uh, for gays and lesbians, uh, instead of the mean score being between 65 and 70, the mean score was 49.4. So it was um, 
as much as 16 to um, 16 to 20 points below the average score for these other groups about whom we know there's already some amount of societal um, distance. Uh, so, you know, Hispanics and African Americans are held in higher esteem uh, than, than gays and lesbians. And over 65% of the respondents placed gays and lesbians below the midpoint, below 50, the score of 50. Um, whereas only, again, a third to 45% did the same for, for other groups. Do you think that, that those numbers and those measurements have anything to do with the ballot initiatives that? have uh, been put on the ballot in so many states in recent years? Um, I do, and, and I think that it speaks to the larger question of the variation of opinion across the states and how that, that may affect our, my notion of political power. So when you see that approximately um, two-thirds of all respondents are giving gays and lesbians a score below 50, that's telling elected officials that they can say bad things about gays and lesbians and that could be politically advantageous to them because indeed many parts of the electorate feel the same way. It's also suggesting that the initiative process could be fertile ground to try to mobilize some of these voters to the polls for that cause and for other causes. Um, so similarly we might find for example that you know about half of all people think that um, sex between two people is, is morally wrong but in some states that number would be a lot higher and so you could use that as a place to target um, gays and lesbians. Do you believe that um, the views of major religious denominations uh, have an effect on the political power of gay men and lesbians in this country? I do. What is your view? I think that religion is the chief obstacle for gay and lesbian political progress. And it's the chief obstacle for a couple of reasons. Uh, the first is that it, uh, after government, it's difficult to think of a more powerful um, social entity in American society than the church. Um, religion is something that deeply connects to people's lives. Indeed, a, a America is a very church-going nation compared to other Western democracies. It provides the opportunity for people to meet together on a weekly basis. Uh, so it's a very powerful organization and in large measure they are arrayed against the interest of gays and lesbians. There are exceptions, but in large measure they're arrayed, arrayed against gays and lesbians. This is an important contrast with African Americans because except for the Southern Baptist Church, virtually every denomination was supportive of the civil rights movement at the time. Did you, do you recall uh, Dr. Nathanson's testimony earlier this morning about uh, religious organizations and in their views on gay men and lesbians. I do. And did that affect your views in any way on this issue of the interaction between religious groups and gays and lesbians as it relates to political power? Uh, it confirmed what I had previously believed, which is that uh, biblical condemnation of homosexuality and the teaching that gays are morally inferior um, on a regular basis to a huge percentage of the public makes the political ground, the political opportunity structure very hostile to gay interest. It's very difficult to overcome that. And are you aware from your, your work in responding to Dr. Nathanson that he's a professor, professor of religious studies? Uh, I don't believe he actually holds a professorial position anywhere. That he, his area of specialty is religious studies? That's correct. And did you also, uh, do you recall uh, Professor Dr. Young's testimony earlier this morning regarding the views of religious denominations in the United States as to gay men and lesbians? I do. And what is your understanding of Dr. Young's position? I think Dr. Young freely admits that religious hostility uh, to, to homosexuals um, is an important role in um, creating a, a social climate that's conducive to hateful acts, to um, opposition to their interest in, in the public sphere, uh, and to prejudice and discrimination. Can you point to any other in situation in which religious groups in the United States have been so unified in their opposition to a particular minority social group? Um, I cannot. Uh, a moment ago I gave the example of 
the relatively high level of unity during the black civil rights movement in favor of the social group. Um, but there's even an interesting piece of, of work that I relied on in my opinion by a scholar of religion and politics who suggested that opposition to homosexuality has been a real boost in the arm for the ecumenical movement because it's something on which many different um, sects could agree. And so you, it's served as the basis of cooperation between religious denominations. Is violence against gay men and lesbians another factor that you believe, in your expert opinion, contributes to the lack of political power of that group? It is. Why is that? So um, it's important to understand conceptually what we think a hate crime is. So a hate crime is distinguished from a, a, a simple assault in that um, it targets not just the individual who's being assaulted, but it is intended to send a message to the entire group. That's why there has to be the extenuating uh, circumstances to suggest that the person was targeted for their identity. So if a gay man is beaten in a particular part of town, it's not just that he's a victim. The intended message is that uh, you shouldn't be here in this part of town, or you shouldn't be engaging in the behavior in which you're engaging, or um, you're, you're not supposed to have a public expression of self in the normal commerce of everyday life. Creates a, a fear that really constrains or chills what individuals would do in, in the normal daily activities of life. So it's, desi it's designed to, to make you pull back, to make you less active. If you have a fear of violence, you're less likely to self-identify. If you have a fear of violence, you're less likely to go to a place where someone might see that by virtue of your being there, you actually are gay or lesbian. Um, if there's violence, you might know that if you go to a certain place, there's some chance that you will be hurt. Um, I have uh, known of individuals who simply don't leave a bar without two people because it's just not safe. In, in many parts of the country, it's a, it, it can be quite hazardous. In your work on this, did you study and, and review the, hate, the FBI hate crime statistics that are uh, now in evidence as plaintiff's exhibits 489 through 494 covering the years 2003 through 2008? Um, I, I reviewed 2003 through 2007 for my report and deposition. The 2008 numbers had not yet been released when I was deposed. Have you since reviewed the 2008 statistics? I have. And did you also review the uh, Los Angeles hate crime report that has now been admitted as Plaintiff's Exhibit 834? I did. And did, when did you review that? That, too, was released after my deposition. It was released in the latter part of last year. Uh, with the court's permission, I'd like to display demonstrative number seven and, <laughs> and ask you, P Professor Segura, um, um, have hate crimes been on the increase or the decrease um, in the United States as directed against gay men and lesbians? Um, the, the data that I observed show that uh, over the last decade, there has been no real improvement, no real decline. And over the last five years, there's actually been an increase uh, in violence directed towards gay men and lesbians. And in 2008, we have those on the, on the demonstrative. What, um, what did, was there an increase between 2007 and 2008 in, in hate crimes? There was a substantial increase. And I would also point to the next column of figures, which is the share of all hate crimes. So what's happening is that gays and lesbians are representing a larger and larger portion of the number of acts of, of bias-motivated violence. And when, when we talk about hate crimes, and when the FBI talks about hate crimes, what is your understanding in terms of the definition of a hate crime offense? My understanding of a hate crime <coughs> offense, as the FBI collects it, is that there has to be an underlying criminal offense on which there are exacerbating characteristics uh, suggesting that the purpose of the offense was bias-related. So. Um, it's not just simply a shouting an epithet, it's shouting an epithet in association with an act of vandalism or an association with a felonious assault or an association with a robbery or something like that. How do the um, hate crime figures for 2008 compare to the, uh, the levels each year over the prior decade? 
2008 is the highest, I think, for the last uh, period of time and uh, and represents a, a pretty substantial increase. I know that the numbers are also uh, up in, in California and in Los Angeles County. It's also important to, to look at the intensity. So um, we don't want to look at just the number of crimes, but we want to look at the type of crimes. So one of the things the FBI does is it looks at um, what percentage of the hate crimes were violent as opposed to simply an act of vandalism. And it turns out that gays and lesbians are far more likely to experience violence. Like, I think of the number 73% of all the hate crimes committed against gays and lesbians also include an act of violence. And in 2008, when we're, when we're talking about this, the most extreme forms of, of hate-based violence, so rape and murder, 71% um, of all hate-motivated murders in the United States were of gay men and lesbians in 2008. 55% uh, of all hate-motivated rapes. Uh, were against gays and lesbians in 2008. There, there is simply no other person in society who endures the likelihood of being harmed as a consequence of their identity than a gay man or lesbian. I asked you about the Los Angeles data. I would like to have displayed um, Plaintiff's Exhibit 834 uh, and, and ask you a few questions and have you turn to that exhibit in uh, in your binder, and that is the 2008 Los Angeles hate crimes report. Okay. You've reviewed this document, correct? I have. Um, what does it tell you about the situation concerning <laughs> hate crimes with respect to gay and lesbian individuals in, in Los Angeles? Um, it tells me a couple of things. Um, so, uh, I'm, I, I was particularly took note of, a, of um, two items, and, and there are perhaps others. The first is that uh, hate crimes on the basis of race, ethnicity, and national origin from 2007 to 2008 declined by 16%. Which page are you looking at? Uh, nine. Page nine on the screen. Thank you. You can continue. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Uh, no problem. Uh, so um, there's a decline. Uh, in race, racial and ethnic hate crimes, which I, I think is a good thing. Um, but in the same period of time, there's an increase of 21% in bias-motivated crimes against gays and lesbians. So even if there is a sort of general negative drift overall, the drift for gays and lesbians is positive. The second thing I took note of was that um, on page 14, um, Los Angeles County documented a fair number of hate crimes specifically related to the Proposition 8 ballot initiative. And, and, what, did, and what did the report conclude specifically? Um, that there were um, uh, some number of crimes. I believe there were um, nine uh, acts of vandalism. There were um, uh, a number of other uh, smaller um, numbers of, of physical assaults associated with, with Proposition 8. These included acts of graffiti, the targeting of cars, um, et cetera. And, we're, and you'll see at the bottom it says, in addition, there were four violent crimes. Um, I'm sorry. I'm, oh, yes, and, and yes. four violent crimes. That's the very last line. Um, I'd like you to turn, <laughs> to, learn, turn to page 26, please. <laughs> And uh, perhaps you can describe what this, what the report concludes here, and how that affects your views concerning the political power of gay men and lesbians. Um, well, so this reports the distribution of uh, crimes um, by um, uh, targeting p people on the basis of real or perceived sexual orientation, uh, and it shows that um, in a couple of categories the number declined, and in most of the categories, the numbers increased and increased sizably. And were you uh, in court yesterday during the testimony of Mayor Sanders from San Diego? I was in the overflow room upstairs, yes. Did you, were, did you see uh, the advertisement that was played during his testimony concerning alleged acts of vandalism uh, relating to Proposition 8 proponents? I did. Is that undermine your view that 
hate crimes and violence directed against gay men and lesbians is a factor that undermines, that detracts, that renders uh, less the political power of gay men and lesbians. I wasn't quite sure what to make of that, that video. Um, on the one hand, let me state categorically, I think those sorts of behaviors are unacceptable. And um, I would also state that as a political scientist, I am aware of, and there is a small literature on, acts of vandalism, even in candidate-based elections. Electioneering activities are, are frequently not pleasant, tearing down of signs, etc. cetera. Um, that notwithstanding, um, I thought it was interesting that their video um, certainly doesn't report any acts in the opposite direction, acts of vandalism, as Mayor Sanders pointed out, you know, even in front of his own house, the tearing down of pro-8 signs, um, the uh, hundred or more acts of violence against gays and lesbians during the course of 2008, uh, that, that a, a more balanced way to look at what the effect of these behaviors would be to look at the effects from both sides. And obviously that was, you know, not the interest of the, of the advocates producing the video, but. In your view, uh, in, in the political world and in American society, is there pressure on gay men and lesbians to remain invisible to a certain extent? Certainly. Visible? I mean, invisible. 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 Um, I think that um, the sort of the psychology of the closet and the social and economic pressures of the closet are still quite relentless and, and insidious. They do vary dramatically across the country, and they do vary across racial and ethnic groups and across socioeconomic status. Um, so uh, for people who are in sort of working class occupations, for people who are from the Deep South or the Great Plains states, um, self-identification as a gay man or a lesbian can be quite detrimental to one's health, one's income. There's still a profound incentive to not self-identify. How does that factor contribute, if any, in any way, to the political powerlessness of gay men and lesbians, in your view? For starters, um, if you can't self-identify, you're not really available for political mobilization. Um, any rational person would conclude that, you know, even though I'm secretly gay or lesbian, I'm going to go to the gay rights march. That, that that's not going to work out for them because your attendance at the Gay Rights March would be at least an indicator to the public that perhaps you're a member of the community. So um, if you're in the closet, you're unlikely to mobilize. Um, if you're in the closet, it's difficult for you to even necessarily have information about what other gays and lesbians are doing. Um, it's harder for gays and lesbians to find one another for political mobilization, particularly in places where their density is, is smaller. Um, the other effect is that it creates a misperception in the public. So when the public sees gays and lesbians, what they see are gays and lesbians in major cities. And they conclude, gee, you know, there's lots of gay activism and there's, you know, all the, all the gay men I've ever seen, you know, ha or have advanced degrees and, and whatnot. When in fact, that, that's something of a misperception because it's the gays and lesbians you don't see that present the other side of that picture. People who, for economic necessity or for physical safety, have chosen not to self-identify. So the public has a lower estimation of the total number of gays and lesbians. They have a misinformed estimation of the socioeconomic status of gays and lesbians. Uh, and I think they have a misperception of the quality of life or, or the, the, the level of societal treatment of gays and lesbians. Not every gay man is Will in From Will and Grace. What does that have, though, to do with political power or powerlessness? Well, because people are likely to perceive gays and lesbians as not having any political needs. Um, going back to my Will and Grace example, you know, Will was an attorney in Manhattan with a large apartment and a private practice. That is not the reality of every gay man in America. Um, and as a consequence, when people see this, they're going to say, well, you know, these are not individuals who need any form of protection. What do you mean we need anti-discrimination laws? You know, uh, there's lots of, of gay people in, in, in prominent jobs. Uh, so it makes the public a little bit less sympathetic, 
makes the public think that there's less need for some of these protections. It also makes the public uh, view the numbers of gays and lesbians as being smaller and therefore maybe not as politically interesting. How about the concept of censorship? Are gay men and lesbians in society censored in any way that's relevant to the concept of their political power? Um, over the last 25 years or so, there have been um, statutory uh, enactments preventing, for example, the discussion of homosexuality in um, public health classes in school. Um, some states specifically forbid the mentioning of homosexuality in health classes or actually instruct teachers to tell students that it's not an acceptable lifestyle and it's unhealthy. Um, there was a ban on the funding of any art that had homoerotic images in it for the National Endowment for the Arts for a period of time. There was even a period of time where one of the states had a provision in their anti-HIV education program that said that uh, no, no um, portrayal of homosexuality can be used in the discussion of safe sex instructions to prevent HIV transmission, which struck me as particularly odd. Um, if we go back historically, of course, there were periods of time when gays and lesbians weren't allowed to use the mails, that the transmission of material through the U.S. mails related to gay and lesbian political activity was considered to be obscene and therefore uh, illegal. Is there anything in the Yes on 8 campaign that occurred here in California that illustrates the censorship point you just made? Your Honor, I, I would object. Uh, this is not a subject that's addressed in his report. <clears throat> Censorship certainly was an issue in the report, Your Honor, and I believe Mr. Thompson uh, vigorously questioned the witness about his views as to what uh, prompted the passage of Proposition 8, questioned him in great detail about Proposition 8 in the campaign. My, my objection stands. I don't believe it's in the report. Well, it was... I gather you're not disputing that this was a subject explored at the witness's deposition. We, we did discuss uh, the, the motivations behind Proposition 8. Yes, Your Honor. Then I think it's appropriate to explore that in his testimony. You Thank may you, proceed, Honor. Mr. Boutrous. Thank you, Your Honor. Is there anything about the Proposition 8 campaign, by the Yes on 8 campaign, that illustrates the censorship point that you discussed a few moments ago? So... Uh, one of the enduring um, sort of tropes of uh, anti-gay uh, argumentation has been that gays are a threat to children. And um, one particular instance in the Prop 8 campaign was campaign advertisement saying, uh, at school today, I was uh, a young girl saying, at school today, I was told that I could marry a princess too. And the underlying message of that is that the public school, that if we, if Prop 8 fails, the public schools are going to turn my daughter into a lesbian. Um, the, I mean, at some level, the notion is, is um, a little bit uh, amusing or, or risible, but on another level, it's sort of a reflection that um, there is a very strong taboo about the portrayal of homosexuality as anything other than pathological. Uh, in, in the views of a lot of Americans. Uh, it's never to be talked about, not only not positively, but even neutrally. How does that affect, in your view as a political science, the public's view concerning the value of the contributions made to society by gay men and lesbians? Well, it certainly lowers their familiarity. Um, so if the public is not aware of any contributions of of gay people to American life or, or to world society, or if they're aware of the contributions but the individual is not identified as being gay or lesbian, then the public might reasonably conclude that they, they don't have any evidence of significant social contributions by gay men and lesbians. How does that affect the political power? Again, it demeans the relative worth of the community vis-a-vis -vis all others. And does it make other groups not take gay men and lesbians as seriously when they speak out on behalf of a particular issue? Conceivably, it means that uh, they're not taken as seriously. Uh, it also might mean that they're not seen as desirable coalition partners. 
Uh, and at the same time, it makes them easier targets. It's easier to target people who've never contributed anything. You don't dispute, do you, that gay men and lesbians do have some allies in the political system in California and in the United States? They do, of varying reliability, but they do. Why doesn't that give that group political power in this country? Okay, so the question of allies is an important one because we need to look at allies with respect to both their reliability, with respect to the range of their uh, potential actions on behalf of gays and lesbians, um, and with respect to kind of what potential outcomes they can and can't secure with the, with the structure of the governmental system. So it is nice to have allies, and uh, if those allies are reliable, that's even better. But there are a number of instances where ostensible allies of the gay community, uh, when faced with difficult decisions that might be electorally risky, retreat and, and retreat quickly. Um, or uh, there's also the disconnect on, between, say, rhetoric on the one hand and action on the other. So uh, if you think of the major groups in society, you know, outside of the commercial enterprises, um, you, you think about you know, the, the military, the church, the Democratic and Republican parties. These are, are, are the power centers in American society. And, and of those, only the Democratic Party purports to be an ally of gays and lesbians. But the Defense of Marriage Act was signed into law by a Democratic president. Don't Ask, Don't Tell was passed by a Democratic Congress and signed into law by a Democratic president. The current president describes himself as a fierce advocate of gay and lesbian uh, civil rights, but yet has actually taken no steps to overturn either of those, and and actually I, I understand has refused an order by the chief judge of the Ninth Circuit to provide domestic partner benefits to his clerk, uh, so and has filed briefs uh, hostile to gay and lesbian interests. So even fierce advocates are are submitting briefs supporting the Defense of Marriage Act, comparing. Um, uh, gay and lesbian same-sex marriage to, to bestiality. Uh, this is not a reliable ally. Now, certainly some allies are more reliable than that, but we have to look at the disconnect between rhetoric and action. In, in your view, is, is a smaller group in society more in need of reliable allies in the political sphere? Um, well, just from the, the absolute numerical question of electoral politics, the smaller the group, the more allies necessary in order to, to sustain the day. Uh, that, that's clearly the case. Um, if you are particularly insular or you're geographically isolated without allies, you're very unlikely to have an impact beyond you know, fairly limited geographic circumstances. In, in your expert opinion, does the gay and lesbian community have any reliable allies in, in, in the way you're using that term from a political science standpoint? Um, sure. I wouldn't say that they have no reliable allies. I think that would be um, an unfair statement. I think that when we look at kind of across the country and across the range of issues, the number of allies on which gays and lesbians can count on in a tough fight is fairly small, but I wouldn't say it's zero. Do you think that those that group of reliable allies is, is sufficient to give gay men and lesbians political power in the United States? My view, no. What has been the impact of HIV and AIDS on the political power of gay men and lesbians in this country? So I spoke before about the fairly small numbers of gays and lesbians. Those numbers are diminished by over 300,000 uh, deaths of um, men in, engaged primarily in, in same-sex sexual behavior from HIV, another quarter of a million infections um, in the same category. So that's done a couple of things. One is it's diminished the voting power of, of a group that's already small. Uh, second, the disease has rather dramatically sapped the financial resources of the group. Um, Obviously, the 300,000 who have passed are not in a position to make contributions. Those who are ill are frequently on disability, uh, spending untold treasure on their medications. More importantly, resources from the healthy uh, are being 
directed towards HIV activities uh, and action, prevention campaigns, HIV support um, uh, charities and whatnot, quite rightly. And finally, during the period of the, of the worst severity of the AIDS epidemic, that was frankly the more important agenda item, that gays and lesbians turned their attention first to surviving before engaging the political system. So I think HIV has been a, a real setback, certainly for the people who, who have been infected, but, but, but for the cause as well. And when a group, a, a minority group, faces a well-orchestrated, well-funded opposition, does that affect its powerlessness in our political system? Right. Um, and so I think this really kind of gets to one of the central problems that gays and lesbians face in the political system. So you can imagine, for the sake of hypothesis, uh, that there are two groups with exactly the same number of voters with exactly the same number of dollars. Um, are they equally powerful? And the answer is no, because that depends on what their opposition is. So you can imagine a group that faces relatively little hostility or relatively little opposition, uh, and we would assume that they would be more powerful than a group that faces well-funded and coordinated opposition, um, just simply even with the same amount of resources, because uh, it's tougher sledding. It's an uphill uh, battle for the group with, with strong opposition. Um, Your Honor, I'm going to uh, ask to approach to provide the witness with another smaller collection of exhibits in a binder and provide the court and opposing counsel with those exhibits, if that's okay. Very well. Thank you. I'm going to present the clerk with a, a listing of the exhibits for the convenience of the court. And I, I provided a copy to the witness and opposing counsel as well. Very well. Professor Segura, um, in, I'd like you to start out by uh, opening the binder to exhibit, plaintiff's exhibit 1550. and ask you if this is a document that you reviewed in connection with your uh, testimony in this case. It is. And um, before I ask you questions about that document, did you uh, <coughs> study the Proposition 8 campaign and, and draw any conclusions about uh, the degree of opposition that um, gay men and lesbians faced during the Proposition 8 campaign? I generally familiarize myself with the details of the campaign, but I can't say as I went into any depth on the organizations of, of the two sides. So I know what, what money was spent, et cetera, um, but I didn't really have available to me a lot of information about, for example, volunteerism and those sorts of things. And since, since uh, you've been involved in this case, um, were you provided with certain documents that were received by the plaintiffs during the discovery over the last week uh, from the proponents of Proposition 8 in this case? I was. And is, is one of those documents Plaintiff's Exhibit 1550? It is. And could you tell us um, what, if anything, well, describe this document and, and explain to the court what, if anything, it tells you about the uh, political opposition arrayed against gay men and lesbians? Um, it appears to be a flyer or perhaps a web screen capture then sent as an, an electronic mail. Um, there, there are two things in it that I, I took note of when I was looking through it. Um, the first is the um, on, on the second page the role of the LDS Church in supporting Prop 8. 
And, um, Your Honor, I would move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 1550. No objection, Your Honor. Well, 1550 is admitted. And if we could uh, display exhibit, Plaintiff's Exhibit 1550, and Professor Segura, I would ask, I ask you to uh, uh, direct us to the, per, the portion that you're referring to on page 2 and, and read uh, the portion that you found relevant. Page 2, under the title, LDS Church Takes an Active Role. Um, I, I'm, I'm particularly interested in a couple of notes. First, uh, the second sentence, a letter from the First Presidency of the LDS Church in Salt Lake announced the church's official position during Sunday services on June 29th. The LDS Church rarely takes an official stand on political issues, but in this case, the First Presidency sent a letter to the highest worldwide church leaders and California local LDS leaders. And why do you find that relevant to the question of political power and powerlessness of gay men and lesbians? Um, churches, uh, many churches, and, and the LDS Church I would include in this, are um, hierarchical. They have very clear patterns and lines of communication. All churches have the, um, the good fortune to essentially be able to speak to their flock once a week or more. Uh, which m makes for a very strong communications network. And so to me, this illustrated that the, the LDS Church was, was very active, not just on the, on the financial side, but even in the, in the sort of grassroots side of, um, of pushing forward the proposition. Please turn to page, fifth, uh, play, page 3 of Plaintiff's Exhibit 1550. Is there anything on that page that you found relevant to your analysis of the political forces arrayed against gay men and lesbians in the Prop 8 campaign? Uh, sure. Under the um, uh, subtitle Pastors Committee. You could read that for the record and, and then explain what, if any, relevance it has to your opinions. Um, on, uh, excuse me, on June 17, 2008, Jim Garlow, senior pastor of Skyline Church in San Diego, released an invitation letter to the state's pastor community asking them to participate in a statewide conference call for pastors. The call, which marked the first in a series of pastor meetings, served to kick off an aggressive grassroots campaign among churches of varying denominations. A total of 1,700 pastors based in 101 locations across the state participated. Hey, what, what relevance does, does that passage have to your analysis of the politically, political powerlessness issue in this case? Um, so in going through these documents, um, Reverend Garlow's name ap appears frequently, um, and he uh, ends up organizing uh, this, um, this team, uh, and it, it goes on to become, I believe, Protect Marriage CA. Uh, and they were very instrumental in trying to involve the evangelical community in supporting the proposition. And I was particularly taken aback by uh, the notion of 1,700 pastors. Um, that is a profound network of, of influence. Uh, I think most campaigns, candidate campaigns, initiative campaigns, party coordinated campaigns would be thrilled to have 1,700 volunteers across the state on any given conference call. I think that that would be considered a heroic success. So this is, this is an, a, a, an admirable organization at some level. I mean, it's, it's enviable. And, and you're not suggesting there's anything wrong with like-minded groups and like-minded organizations, including churches, banding together to fight for a cause they believe in, right? Um, well, of course, there are limitations on, on, under, the, under the tax code about um, political advocacy. But in terms of individual groups working together on, on their own behalf, they're perfectly allowed to do that. And in fact, that's the, the kind of the centerpiece of pluralist democracy is that people get to advocate for what they believe in. I think what's, what, what takes me aback here is just sort of the sheer breadth of, of, of the organization and its level of coordination with Protect Marriage. Let's turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2310, which is the second document in the binder. Is this a document that you reviewed in connection with your work on this case uh, over the last week? It is. 
And um, could you could you describe your understanding of what this document is? Um, uh, this document appears to be a cover page screen capture of protectmarriage.com's website. Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 2310. No objection. 310 is admitted. Professor Segura, was there anything about this document that caught your eye as you evaluated the, the relative political power of gay men and lesbians vis-a-vis -vis others? Um, frankly, it was just the word coalition. So the very first sentence is, protectmarriage.com is a broad-based coalition of California families, community leaders, religious leaders, pro-family organizations, and individuals from all walks of life who have joined together to support Proposition 8. Um, and so I, coalitions we know exist you know, in, in, in an informal sense in all forms of political contestation. And this appeared to be sort of a, a stipulation of a more formal association. Um, so it was more of an impression that I got from, from that sentence that, you know, that there was a, you know, an organized effort here uh, rather than just simply a group of people who happened to agree. Based on your evaluation of the record in this case before you saw these documents and, and um, in connection with public <coughs> statements uh, that you had seen previously, was the use of the word coalition significant to you in this document? Um, when I evaluate the political opportunity structure that gays and lesbians face in, in, in my evaluation of their level of power or powerlessness, um, it enhances my understanding and enhances my estimation of the strength of their opposition. Professor Skura, please turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2314. I'm there. Have you reviewed this document? I have. What does, uh, could you describe this document and then I'll, I'll ask that it be moved into evidence before you go on, but just give a your, your over, overall description of the document, please. Um, this is also a screen capture of a website um, called the Pastor's Rapid Response Team, um, uh, which um, sounds fun. Um, and uh, and I, I'm sorry, just it, the, the term rapid response just struck me as odd. Um, and again, it's headed by um, Jim Garlow from Skyline Church. And uh, Your Honor, I move admission of Plaintiff's Exhibit 2314. No objection, Your Honor. Well, 2314 is in. Thank you, Your Honor. Please display Exhibit 2314. Um, in, in political parlance, uh, Professor Segura, what is a rapid response team? It's it, it's an unusual term uh, in in political science. I'm I'm more accustomed to the term with respect to um, toxic waste spills or fires or emer medical emergency sorts of things. Um, so I'm not sure what they had in mind when when they coined the term. Um, I would assume that that what they wanted to do would be in a position to um, put out responses to or. To, to stage a public event quickly in response to sort of developments throughout the course of the campaign, the, the word rapid and response being the key words there. Uh, but but um, I was just more taken aback that there was an organization who was sort of um, regularly monitoring everything and ready to, to go um, at a moment's notice. And, uh, well, thank you. Um, let's turn to Plaintiff's Exhibit 2389. Your Honor, I'd like to say we're getting to a part of this binder where there are many documents that are stamped attorney's eyes only, uh, highly confidential. This document doesn't have that stamp on it, but we believe it is confidential. We haven't had an opportunity to uh, have dialogue with plaintiff's counsel about the extent to which we might be able to lift those uh, designations, but we're certainly concerned about these documents being discussed in open court without having an opportunity to assess that, and I might suggest that we take a lunch break and uh, look and see whether we can work with plaintiff's counsel to resolve those issues without uh, having to take the court's time with the fighting document by document over this on the fly. If I may, Your Honor, Attorney yes. McCarthy, I represent uh, Pastor Jim Garlow and Pastor Miles McPherson. And uh, I have concerns regarding these documents, which I haven't seen, Your Honor. 
I'm presently in the process of discussing with counsel for the plaintiffs uh, a potential agreement on the motion to quash and for protective order that I've filed in this matter. My clients are currently reviewing certain documents and disks, some of which appear to be the documents that are being introduced here to make a decision as to whether or not they will agree to the introduction of those documents and or authenticity of the documents. For, for plaintiffs to be introducing these while telling me that they want my clients to review them uh, for, on the issues of both authenticity and admissibility, I think is somewhat misleading. Uh, we are still reviewing these documents, and if they are going to be introduced at this point, or or counsel is going to uh, seek to introduce them, then I would like to have the motion to quash and for protective order decided, because the part of the motion that goes to a protective order goes to any testimony by Pastors Garlow and McPherson. And if these documents include testimonial uh, matters regarding these two pastors, then they are included within the motion for protective order. Uh, as, as Your Honor knows, we have argued not only under the earlier Perry decision, but the Trunk decision, that there are First Amendment implications to the introduction of testimonial evidence from pastors, particularly a, a lot of this, I think, concerns sermons that they've given, speeches that they've given to other people regarding their biblical beliefs, and all of which we believe are protected by the First Amendment and have been argued in the uh, motion papers that Your Honor presently has. Well, Mr. Boutros, I guess there are two suggestions. Mr. Thompson's suggestion for lunch. <laughs> and then uh, uh, the comment raised by counsel for uh, Reverend Garland. Um, I have no objection to the lunch suggestion. <laughs> uh, let me make that clear. But let me just address two of the points. First, counsel, we provided this gentleman with um, disks, documents, asked him over the weekend as I represented court, we would do, to review the documents that we, we might use to absolve his clients of having to appear and testify about them. He sent us back an email, which I can provide the court. I was hoping to spare you having to delve into this, basically saying that it would be too burdensome for his clients to review the documents uh, to tell us whether they had any objection to us using them and essentially refused to participate in the back and forth on the documents. That's number one. Number two, this document that is, as Mr. Thompson astutely noted, the next exhibit, Plaintiff's Exhibit 2389, does not say attorney's eyes only. It was not designated confidential. It's, a, it's a, an email from Ned D'Alessi, who was on the executive committee of the um, protectmarriage.com, and we obtained it from uh, the formerly anonymous Mr. Swordstrom in production without any limitation on our using this document whatsoever. Um, the third point I would make, Your Honor, is that these are documents that were produced um, after the Ninth Circuit amended its, its opinion, footnote 12, after Judge Sparrow ruled uh, regarding the scope of the privilege. These are documents that were disseminated widely, widely. The, the, some of the documents you'll see, Your Honor, they, they talk about 3,000 pastors on a conference call in order to disseminate more messages to, to huge numbers of people. And so they're clearly not within any cognizable scope of a First Amendment privilege, and they're covered, and this is um, covered by the order that the court today upheld from Judge Sparrow. So, um, and then finally, we did redact the names. Um, we did not do it on this document because it was not produced pursuant to any protective order, but it, the, the version I have provided the court and the witness, and that I was going to seek admission of evidence, um, we redacted the names that we, we believed. Um, had not been made public or we didn't know, um, consistent with the agreement that I made with Mr. Cooper last week uh, regarding the use of these documents. And, um, and we did have a dialogue with, uh, with the, the proponents' counsel over the weekend uh, in terms of redaction, and, and I think some of the things we did agree on um, and others were in the middle of trial with witnesses. We just took our best good faith effort to uh, eliminate names of people we didn't 
have information concerning to the, uh, the extent to which they had been publicly revealed. So I don't think there's any basis for any objection to these documents. They're documents produced by the proponents or the individual uh, members of the executive committee in, in the latter case without any limitation on, on our use. You're representing that uh, Exhibit 2389 and the <coughs> other uh, documents that are contained in this binder uh, came from the sources you identified rather than from uh, counsel's client. Correct, Your Honor. Your Honor, if I may just correct the record. Um, I don't think one hand knows what the other is doing with regard to plaintiff's team. There's an attorney named Lazarus who I am dealing with who presented me yesterday with a separate binder with, I believe, eight disks in it and about 10 or 12 documents. She stated to me on the phone that if my clients would review them, she would with and agree to the admissibility or not admissibility, authenticity of the documents, she would withdraw the subpoenas. Now, I sent those documents in good faith together with the disks by overnight mail yesterday to my clients because the prior uh, package that had been sent to me was over 40 hours in length and the uh, plaintiffs wanted my clients to review them on a Sunday and Martin Luther King holiday, which it was impossible to get the documents to them and for them to spend 30 hours on that on a Sunday and Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. So uh, right now, my clients are reviewing them thinking that uh, there's an offer on the table here. So um, we are completely taken by surprise. And if counsel is going to proceed with this, uh, apparently, then they're withdrawing the offer that they made earlier to me yesterday, and I would like an opportunity to argue the motion to quash, and we've also prepared a motion to stay uh, because we'd like to have the Ninth Circuit take a look at this as well. We know of no instance in which pastors have been called to testify regarding their sermons and other biblical interpretations uh, to uh, their uh, congregants and others. Well, that's a separate issue, is it not, from the documents that uh, Mr. Boutrous is proposing to use with this witness? Unless they include testimonial materials, Your Honor, then they would be covered by the motion for protective order. Protective order motion is, is different. As I understand it, these are not documents that were produced by or came from the files of your client. Right, but I'm objecting not only to the authenticity of the documents, but also to the admissibility of the documents because of the First Amendment consideration set out in our motion. That is a separate issue, isn't it? It's only separate if there's no testimonial materials in the documents that have been introduced. Because now, what do you mean testimonial material? In other words, if there are statements from either Pastors Garlow or McPherson in these documents, then what plaintiffs are doing is getting in statements by my clients over the motion for protective order that I have made, protecting any statements made by my clients under the First Amendment. If these statements, however, were made to third parties, what possible protection could there be for these statements? Reiner, I don't even, I haven't seen these before. I have no idea what's in them. I was provided with a That would, that would tell you whether there's some kind of a privilege <laughs> that attaches to the statements, would it not? Well, it would, it, sure, if the, it, if the material in these documents includes uh, biblical interpretations of my clients of the issues that are uh, being talked about here, then the court is really asking a pastor to testify as to his view of traditional marriage, of same-sex marriage, and uh, we believe that would violate the First Amendment rights of a pastor to do that, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I make one point? This was a pastor who was on the pastor rapid response team, so he, <laughs> he injected himself into the political sphere. Oh, so you're um, saying he can respond quickly, is that <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had thought of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's take Mr. Thompson's suggestion and have lunch, and then you and Mr. Thompson can work out uh, Thank you, Your Honor. whatever you want with respect to these documents. 
One other piece of information for our counsel. Uh, I have been informed that Magistrate Judge Sparrow has heard the parties on proponent's motion to expand the designation of the proponent's core group. Magistrate Judge Spiro granted proponent's motion with respect to John Doe, but denied the motion with respect to Rob Worthland, Richard Peterson, and Bill Criswell. So you may consider that in the course of your discussions. All Thank right. you, Your Honor. Yes. Delessi? Error. And I, as you probably oh. Uh, Mr. Boutros? Yes. Can we resume at uh, five minutes after one? That's fine with me, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. <laughs>